Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning. Yeah, thanks. Thanks uh, for showing up. Uh, Zoom is populating. We're in the Great Plains room. I would say head count wise for those online, we've got 30, 30 souls in the Great Plains room, spatially separated, wearing masks, um, boosted up. And I walked over there. We had uh, 92, give or take folks and the, and the Zoom was rapidly populating, so a um, little chilly this morning. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to invite a colleague that some of us uh, know, those of us on the East Campus, uh, Wahadi Allen. Uh, Wahadi is, uh, come on up here, Wahadi. Yeah, woohoo is right. And you get the big mic, Wahadi. Uh, Wahadi is our chef here in the uh, East Campus Union in the dining facility. And when we redid the East Campus Union, one of our hopes, and, and I'll, uh, Ron and I talked a lot with the designers, was to um, make sure that the spaces, all the spaces, including the dining hall, uh, just were open and accessible and you felt welcome. I don't know about you, but I, I tried to eat in the dining hall uh, at least once or twice every week. And the old one, I always felt a little, a little like a foreign, foreign entity walking into the student space. And although they were generous, it was a little, it was, felt strange to me. Well, downstairs in the new design, everyone's welcome. And um, I wanted Wahadi, I wanted you to know him. He's amazing, great story, amazing leader. And uh, Wahadi, okay. I'll turn it over to you. I'm gonna Public service announcement. I'm gonna remove my muzzle, guys. <laughs> um, so, when I got invited, I, I thought about what I wanted to, you know, talk to you guys about, what I wanted to mention. And right now, uh, me and my leadership, we're talking a lot about how we can uh, increase our value uh, and sustainability and what that really means. And, you know, I started thinking about this idea of sustainability and, and what that really means for me on a personal level. I'm very sentimental about what I do. And, uh, and I think that uh, most people, when they hear the word sustainability, they think about uh, resources or energy. And for me in a kitchen, uh, or in any operation rather, uh, the most important resource we have uh, are the individuals that, that work for us, the people on our team. And I think when people talk about sustainability, very seldom is that mentioned as a resource that we kind of want to conserve, cultivate, and uh, really lend a lot of value to. And so for anybody that's in leadership on campus, you know, the university is a great organization. I've been here for a short time, but the way that they prioritize people uh, and they prioritize the experience and they prioritize creating community, uh, it's a really, really wonderful thing. And so when you're thinking about what you're going to eat for lunch or, or, or where you're going or so forth and so on, think about the fact that if you come down and you allow dining to provide that experience for you, uh, you're helping to create a more sustainable environment uh, in relation to this organization and how much it actually lends value to the city that we live in and the state. You know, so. Uh, so I'll just leave you guys with, with that kind of as a personal question to deal with, you know, what does sustainability mean to you? That's what it means to me. It means valuing every relationship and, uh, and understanding uh, that there's a lot of vital energy in that and that it's a very valuable resource. So I look forward to seeing you guys downstairs and thank you for uh, letting me overshare. We appreciate yeah. that. Have a good one. Thanks, Wahadi. Oh, there we go. Yeah, um, just to put a fine point on that, the dining hall is open to anyone who shows up a la carte uh, for breakfast and for lunch. And I think it gets back to the meal plan for dinner, but um, please come on over, grab lunch, have lunch meetings, bring, uh, bring your student groups, encourage your graduate students. It really is everyone's uh, dining facility and thanks Wahadi and the entire crew down there for sustaining us, no question about that. Okay, um, well thankfully it's, it doesn't look like this outside and, and, and in fact this bridge doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> we've, uh, we've fixed this, this is over in the Maxwell Arboretum, but um, just kind of a, 
uh, thought and reflection. I hope you had a good holiday winter break and uh, were able to recharge. Um, really, I thought in, in all hopefulness that we would be together and uh, these would be something we put in our scrapbooks, but uh, reality is uh, Omicron hit uh, just perfectly timed with the start of the spring semester and so we're continuing to do uh, the right thing and take care of each other and keep moving, moving things along. You know, it was five years ago, okay, a little over five years ago, that I had my first trip across Nebraska. And, and, and um, Ron, Ron was the driver on that trip. We made a loop out to uh, Curtis, and then we went up to, uh, through Lake McConaughey and up to uh, Sand Hills to see Goodmanson and then back. Um, that was the, the extent of that trip. And um, wow, uh, this map shows where I've been. Uh, I literally carry this old map. It's got, it's got Dave Heinemann's picture on the back of the map. One thing I learned very early, we're frugal folks out here. <laughs> we don't really get bothered by who the governor is, at least on the rest stops. If you pick up a map, you'll probably find one. Um, but what a trip. Um, I just, it took me a while with COVID to hit all 93 counties. I said during my interview, way back in 16 that I wanted to get to all the counties. Well, uh, Kippahaw and Boyd were the last two. What a, what a neat stretch of Highway 12 between Valentine and, and that part of the state. You have to be intentional up there. Um, but it is an amazing state. All 531 communities and the spaces between those communities is a privilege to serve. And to our 600 uh, faculty and staff who, who live in greater Nebraska, who are engaging with us, that's about a third of our faculty and staff in the Institute don't live in Lancaster County, don't come to campus, they don't get to eat in the East Campus dining room, but um, when they're here, I'm sure they will now, Wahadi. It's a pretty amazing place, and if you see some things that, um, some roads, some, some towns that I've missed, that you say, you have to get to that, put that, send me an email, um, and uh, I'll, I'll make sure I get there. But, you know, Wahadi said it, uh, the most valuable asset that we have our people, no question about that. Uh, every person and every interaction matters. That's, uh, we're gonna talk about the end 2025 today. Um, but uh, thanks to each of you. Um, again, going back, I'll talk a little bit about COVID, but we're living it. Your experts, uh, we're all experts now in this journey. Um, I, I get that we're all a bit tired. We're all a bit weary. Uh, we have all been touched by COVID. In, um, in not so positive ways. Um, and uh, yet every day I wake up and feel fortunate for most of us that we have a job that we uh, enjoy that's a meaningful, a sense of belonging in the communities that we're a part of. Um, and yet uh, our lives have been um, forever changed. So thanks for what you do and, and uh, we, know, we, know, we know that everybody's digging deep and keeping their feet moving. Um, reach out to those uh, immediate to you if you, if you feel the need. Uh, reach out to um, our uh, faculty and staff assistance programs. Help direct students to the Kasner office, to CAPS. Just really be, um, be mindful that um, we're all, we all have our good days and our bad days and take care of each other. Thank you. The people that we have in the Institute for the last now going on 12 years have really focused on these six um, foundational pillars, um, our six communities. We've hired amazing uh, colleagues. Uh, every time we have a decision on where resources go from an academic department or a focus area or an engagement zone, everybody's making decisions about how we drive impact and how our contributions advance um, society in these, these ways. I share this picture because I think there was a, a real turning point for us um, in, in the eyes of many people across the country. And this was uh, from about 18 months ago when then Secretary Sonny Perdue came. He could have gone anywhere in the country, Mark, but he came here to Lincoln, Nebraska, to the Innovation Campus to unpack and talk about innovation in agriculture and natural resources. It was a great day. Um, we were able to give him a tour 
And from that conversation in September of 20, um, 2020, now propelled forward, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in Washington. This is a picture that I took uh, from a visit that several of us made just before um, the holiday winter break, visiting members on the Hill, visiting agency uh, partners. It was, a, it was an important day, and I'll talk more about this. Um, some of the big things that are taking place that, you know, I would just ask you to keep watching the newspapers closely is uh, a big thrust to create a new USDA Ag Research Service Center of Excellence, a national center of excellence on resilient and regenerative precision agriculture. This is a big deal that uh, involves uh, $139 million, um, uh, about $120 million of construction and design. We're in the design phase right now. Uh, if you've been over to the Innovation Campus, we'll be, the ARS is uh, going to be building a building the size of the Scarlet Hotel. It's a big deal. Our colleagues, our 17 scientists and engineers with the USDA that are on the East Campus will be moving with their teams, about 63 people. They'll move over and then the other 20 million in that project is to hire another 20 to 25 scientists and support staff. So net-net, we'll have, we'll have about 42 to, to 45 USDA scientists here in Lincoln, paired up with the 50 over in Clay Center, that 90 miles from Clay Center to Lincoln, that'll be almost 192 USDA ARS scientists uh, combined with our 650 faculty and 1,200 staff. It really is a powerful innovation platform. Um, so this is a big deal. and. Uh, Associated with this is a cool project called the Farm of the Future. It's a national grant program that we advocated for. The first RFP was released last fall. We responded to that uh, thanks to the team led by Joe Luck and, and uh, others. Um, we'll, we're hopeful. Uh, it's a $4 million award. They're only doing one in the entire country. I knew we were on to something, but it was uh, validated when 27 other institutions <laughs> also applied for that. So um, it's, a, it's a big deal, and uh, we'll see where that takes us. There are some other things in there that I'll talk about here in a moment, but a lot going on on the federal advocacy front that partners with what you're doing through the grants programs with our federal agencies and our industry partners. Likewise, some of that federal money has found its way to Nebraska. And um, Ted Carter on October 6th, uh, in front of the Appropriations Committee in the unicameral, laid out a plan for the University of Nebraska to, for $195 million, that's a big number, Sherry, $195 million to, uh, to come to the university. Uh, 75 million of that is targeted to come to um, UNL. Uh, the two projects there is a $25 million allocation for a public-private partnership uh, uh, building, if you will. Uh, just really think about it as a stepped-up um, ag tech transfer of uh, intellectual property. Um, the, it will be about the size of the RISE building, which is where Shane Farrader's office is, it's just to the, get my directions, just to the north of the Greenhouse Innovation Center. So it'll be about an 80,000 square foot building. We're asking for 25 million in the COVID relief money from the unicameral, and that will be paired up with 25 million that we've been working on through private philanthropy. So a $50 million project, um, pretty, pretty amazing. The $50 million, the other 50 is to pick up and transition the Holland Computing Center from the north, north, south stands, sorry, of Memorial Stadium, and then actually move that over to the Innovation Campus with additional capacity that will uh, fuel our ability to make advances in precision and digital agriculture and food, the food value chain. It's a big deal. Um, along with that is a focus on ag agricultural cyber physical security, so physical systems that are run through digital platforms. And I think we all know that um, they're highly susceptible, they're great, but they're highly susceptible to intrusions. 
And if you think about um, ransomware attacks, JBS was hit with a, a ransomware. They paid $11 million just to get back into their systems. It's a big deal, and while we're making pushes in the digital precision space, uh, we really need to be mindful of, of cyber cybersecurity. So we'll see where that goes, um, but it's a big deal. They uh, Unicameral's in session, just to remind us all of that. It's hard not to uh, see that there. I don't know, Jesse, on day 13 or something of a 60-day session, weekends and holidays don't count. They had until last Wednesday, last Thursday, the 20th, to drop bills. They have hundreds of bills to sort through, and now they've started their hearings. Our hearing for that 75 million is scheduled for February 17th, and in fact, this uh, at noon, um, uh, Chancellor Green will be over here visiting about our strategy to uh, provide testimony uh, for that. Okay, so this is a little bit of a stretch, but I'm, I'm an optimistic person, Tiffany. Here are the headlines I think we really have a chance to see in the next 60 to 90 days. $3.8 million allocated by the federal government, the Office of Chief Economist to the National Drought Mitigation Center. It's a big deal. This would provide annual funding um, in perpetuity to that, that platform, which has been in existence now, 25 plus years, big deal. Um, Governor Ricketts signs into law 75 million to the University of Nebraska for those two projects. The USDA receives $40 million for construction on their new facility. That is in the appropriations bill that's been in conference that uh, we're under a continuing resolution until February 18th in the federal government. They're, Washington's moving along so smoothly now, I anticipate that this bill will be appropriated sometime between now and then. Keep your fingers crossed. A little bit of luck in all of this. Another 10 million then for staffing. You can read these headlines, uh, 4.9 million to actually move from design to construction on the expansion of our Feed Yard Innovation Center at, at Mead, um, and then $4 million for that farm of the future. This is. This and several other big items are right there in our grasp. And I want to thank um, countless numbers of folks, faculty and staff, administrators, um, for helping us move this along. And it really is a team effort. OK, with that, as we did at our September All Hands meeting, so that we can stay connected with each other, um, we have a number of, of colleagues who are going to uh, visit with us. And Ruth Y. Woody is our first speaker on animal welfare. Good morning. I'm really excited to be here and to provide an update on the animal welfare program. Uh, so it's essentially a year and a half old. Uh, the expertise, the discipline was not represented before my hire. So that's um, an example of capacity building here. <clears throat> And I'm one of the fortunate few to have a three-way appointment. So I'm gonna to touch on some of our uh, successes, some early, I would say early successes in a uh, year and a half in those three areas. So I inherited um, an online animal welfare course. And a year ago in spring semester, <clears throat> we also offered it in person. From last year to this year, the, just the online section has doubled. As, and the in-person has um, significantly increased as well. A couple notable things I want to point out, um, uh, in keeping with that idea that every person and every interaction matters, I came to the department and found students hungry for this, um, this content and the discussions that we were having. Out of that original in-person class, there were about 24 in that class, one is already employed with Lincoln Premium Poultry um, in a management tr training position where he actually has had the, inter the opportunity to interact with their, um, their leadership team and Dr. Temple Grandin when she visits and consults with them. So um, I, those things all get back to me and we'll continue to be working with Lincoln Premium Poultry. They have expressed a great deal of interest in our undergraduate students in this space. Another undergraduate student uh, 
that the contact in that class led to a UCARE project that um, really drove her interest. She has now been accepted into one of the premier uh, swine welfare programs in the country to, to pursue her master's. Continuing with some of the teaching and advising activities, uh, one of the things that I'm really excited uh, to share is that we are proposing a new specialization for graduate instruction that has gone through departmental approve, approval. It's gonna be co-sponsored by biological systems engineering and animal sciences for graduate student instruction. And I have admitted two graduate students already this semester, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, signaling the start of that as we move towards that. We also started an animal behavior and welfare club, uh, formed an officer team that took a strong leadership role and I, and led that all the way through formalization, recognition as an RSO, you'll notice that. And also, uh, we were represented by members of that club in an international contest. So there is an animal welfare judging competition that's sponsored by the American Veterinary Medical Association, and that occurs once annually. Sure. Our team uh, competed in that. It was virtual this year. They placed five, number five, so fifth out of, um, 86 uh, universities, I believe, and several 269 um, competitors. So that was the the highest attendance uh, in history of that contest. So recognition for um, the program and its growth. On the research side, I'll just touch really briefly. I've had the opportunity to join an existing team that has patented the new track technology. What that has for livestock monitoring, it was developed uh, with swine, and we are moving it forward to to extend the capabilities to cattle. And specifically, we'll be looking at that for monitoring heat stress as uh, one of the next initiatives. So in the middle, you'll see um, a design of a prototype that we built. And this was actually initiated around the supply chain shutdown, uh, and which impacted the ability to uh, get swine or pigs in the, in the state to harvest. And that also resulted in um, significant um, effort, need for mass depopulation. There was an enormous gap in that space. There's a USDA veterinary stockpile of equipment that is um, intended to support the research, the, 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 the growers in the, in the state. And that was significantly lacking. So our, our goal, one, our primary goal was that we would develop something that was um, practical and also increased um, the level of humane handling on farm to rival that, that, that falls under federal regulations in the plant. Um, the most recent update is we've filed for um, a patent on that and we have been contacted by USDA to build additional models uh, for inclusion in the veterinary stockpile. You also heard a little bit about the money, the funding that we have for several projects. One of the things that I focus on also is designing facilities and we'll have an involvement in the uh, Feedlot Innovation Center um, and overseeing some of the, the animal handling designs. It's an opportunity to test facility design in a way that has not been done before in that space. And just briefly, an extension, I've also had the opportunity to join some existing teams. Early on, I identified a couple um, glaring gaps. This goes to a message that we already heard this morning about every person mattering, and that sustainability is um, just indelibly connected to our people. And one of the biggest concerns in the feedlot sector is employee retention, so turnover, injury, and so forth. So I partnered with UNMC. I'm on the Feed, feed Yard Safety Advisory Committee. We've been, uh, we continue to expand the safety curriculum um, and, and pursue a culture of safety in that space. Let me see one other thing. One other uh, um, effort is the Livestock Emergency Response Preparedness Team, and I joined that team as well. It's supported both by um, government, federal, and local dollars. Uh, one of the efforts of that team is to 
train and prepare local law enforcement and um, first responders to respond uh, to understand the, bat the animal um, aspect necessary for responding to vehicle rollovers, yeah. for example. So providing that training, walking firemen in um, bunker gear around animals, giving them some of that, that practical exposure that they need to actually be, be able to first control a scene and then um, triage and respond, work through it. Uh, and that, that's just a real brief overview of what we've accomplished in a year and a half. So thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, talk a little bit about the N2025 strategic plan. I would encourage you, if you haven't um, taken a look at it, you might want to dust it off, take a look. Uh, there was, uh, going all the way back, for those of you who were here, you remember about uh, 200 people involved in the N-150 commission. Uh, IENR had a lot of leadership in that space, and then that led to four of our faculty colleagues coming together to uh, write the plan with lots of work on um, six committees. Uh, just to kind of remind you, uh, these are the six aims of our N2025 plan. The, the, the byline, really, the ethos of the plan is every person and every interaction matters. That's a wonderful aspirational uh, goal for all of us, um, just to have that in the back of our mind. And uh, these are the areas that uh, we're working on. Um, the, a couple of highlight reels, there's a lot of activity, Tala Awada, in Ag Research Division has been really our, our point person, but making sure we're connected through ORED on the Grand Challenges Initiative. Seven areas, um, three of those areas for sure, squarely sit within IANR's leadership space, and then we're connected in a couple of others. So I would encourage you, if you haven't gotten involved, um, what is the carrot that's out there right now? It's uh, $10 million a year that is being distributed to teams internal to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln over the next four years. So that's 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10, $40 million. And uh, everybody should, should be engaging. Our focus areas and extension are nicely aligned with many of these efforts. And, Charlie and Kathleen and the leadership team in Extension is thinking about what that looks like. There are opportunities for us to showcase what Extension is to our colleagues in the, the rest of the institution that maybe don't understand what that is, but they're engaged in outreach activities. So those are opportunities to connect. Um, the folks on this call, this Zoom, in this room understand that. Um, a, lot of key, a lot of key opportunities to both uh, provide leadership, but also garner resources, which is pretty important. Uh, two things just to call your attention to. Uh, first, get involved in the Grand Challenge conversation. Uh, lead in that conversation. And then secondly, uh, Chancellor Green made the decision. You know that when he was uh, invested as chancellor, that was on Founders Day, February 15. Uh, and that's when he's been giving the state of our university address. That's now pivoted. He's going to pivot that back to September, the way it was when he first became chancellor. And this spring, he's going to engage uh, with the deans, with the leaders, with faculty who are working on the aims, the six aims of the N2025 plan. And there are two sessions where folks are going to be invited, I think, to the studio, and they're going to be recorded. Um, maybe moderated, uh, some B-roll footage of cool things that are going on. And there will be two 30-minute uh, uh, vignettes that will be available for all of us to watch to see what we're doing in the areas of the six aims of N2025. And there'll be a couple of town halls for us to engage. I think this is an opportunity to get everybody uh, re-aware re-engaged and then really starting to demonstrate progress in through storytelling and and testimonials and and i think it's uh, it's going to be something that uh, we are eagerly engaged in and excited about and then um, i guess those are the two things sorry stay tuned and get in, get involved 
Okay, John Benson, come on up, John. The Southern Flying Squirrels of East Campus. <laughs> International news from Lincoln, Nebraska on the AP Wire. Great, yeah, great to be with everyone this morning. Um, okay, so I'm doing this. Yeah, so I just wanted to tell you real briefly about a pretty cool new collaboration with uh, SNR students and faculty and actually the citizens of Lincoln. So I'm John Benson. I'm an assistant professor over in SNR and I actually generally work on much larger mammals. So that includes mountain lions in Los Angeles and across California, wolves and predator prey interactions in Canada, bighorn sheep here in Nebraska, and also mule deer in western Nebraska. So if you haven't seen this before, you'll We're definitely get a kick out of it. Yeah. Yeah. One's coming down. Yeah. Oh, back up. He's gonna jump. There he goes. There he goes. This is a lot of these trees. Oh my god. That is insane. <laughs> I've never seen him. I hope they got a nest over here too. <laughs> my favorite part is the little laugh there. Um, but yeah, that was provided by Ben Holmes from the landscaping crew. They're out doing their job removing that dead tree and made this really important discovery. Um, Jeff Culbertson, who is a former fish and wildlife student in SNR, sent that over to Larkin. Larkin sent it to me and uh, we were on our way. So this is where the sighting took place over by Animal Science. And this is actually the geographic distribution of the southern flying squirrel across North America. And you can see it just dips into southeastern Nebraska. And what's really interesting is it doesn't include Lincoln or even Lancaster County. And so that's what made this such an important discovery is we actually didn't think they were here. And so just the kind of timeline here, the video was taken on December 8th. The, we put up a, uh, a nest box. So John Carroll actually built the nest box in his basement shop. And Larkin, John, myself, and others went out and put it up just before Christmas. Turns out it's a really slow news day on the 23rd. And so we had a reporter with the Lincoln Journal Star. But it actually got some kind of national and even international attention. Almost kind of went viral there on the 23rd, which is pretty interesting what people get, <laughs> get interested in. Um, and we pretty quickly put together this kind of little citizen science project. Larkin really spearheaded it by putting together a website where citizens in and around Lincoln can log in and report sightings. And so I think as of yesterday, we're up to 18, which is pretty good for the less than a month. And so it's just really interesting that this species that we didn't even think was here, turns out it's a lot more common than we ever thought. So we're going to build some additional nest boxes. I think John's already cut out the wood for 10 more boxes. We're going to put them together with SNR students in February. And so it's a pretty neat collaboration between students, faculty, and others over at SNR. Uh, I know Game and Parks is quite interested, given that we didn't even think that their distribution extended into Lincoln. And so we just see it as a really cool learning opportunity for UNL students and really the whole Lincoln community. And so if you see a flying squirrel, please let us know. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, I was in a meeting with John Carroll and said, when are the, the t-shirts on sale? So, and then John texted me back and said, I think they have two designs that they're working on. So we'll get those out. What a great, what a great hook for science literacy and uh, increasing our understanding of, of, uh, of, of science and, and uh, really terrific. Well, people. Well, Hadi talked a lot about people. I talked a lot about people. Everybody here puts a premium on, on our, our teams. And uh, Archie Clutter announced, and that came out last Thursday in IANR Weekly, that uh, after a decade plus as our Dean of the Agricultural Research Division, that he is retiring. Um, at the end of this year. And so, Archie, um, we'll have uh, the proper send off, of course, and you're not done yet, so, and you'll hear more, but let's give Archie a round of applause, uh, including those online. There we go. Yeah.
Um, Archie will provide the highlight reel for ARD, but um, as we think about our folks, um, I've asked and they have accepted uh, Dean Tiffany Hang Moss and Dr. Ed Cahoon are going to serve as the two co-chairs of a national search advisory uh, group that will um, follow this timeline. Uh, we're working uh, with Rich Bischoff and IEC to get all of the appropriate paperwork in play, the position descriptions, um, but this is an active role for all of us. Pick up the phone, call your friends, uh, be thinking about who would be a great leader in this space uh, to follow in Archie's uh, footsteps and to build on the foundation that Archie and Hector and Tala and Jake, uh, Jared and, and so many others have uh, put in place. And uh, I'm excited, I'm sad, it's bittersweet, but thank you, Archie, and uh, let's, let's go. Uh, hope is, my hope is that we actually have our new colleague here um, by the start of fall semester. So um, let's, let's go, and uh, Tiffany's looking at me, <laughs> big eyes. We um, celebrate the arrival of new colleagues, uh, both in September, and, but also here at the kind of midterm. So um, welcome to these new folks. As part of prepara uh, preparation for this all hands meeting, I went back and I went through the slide deck from that very first all hands meeting in January of 2017 for me and looked at the faculty, some of you in this room and some of you on the Zoom, it started the same day I did. and so. It's pretty exciting. It's really wonderful to, uh, to see uh, new colleagues join us and the amazing things that, uh, that, that they do. Uh, leaders, uh, Charlie Stoltenau, Dr. Charlie is here. You'll hear from Charlie. Um, welcome, Charlie. Mary Emery is coming most recently as the department chair for the University of South Dakota's uh, Rural Sociology Department. Uh, Mary will be coming as our new director for the Rural Prosperity Nebraska um, uh, platform. Mitch Stevenson is not new, but Mitch has stepped into an interim role as the director out at the Panhandle Research Education Extension Center. Uh, thanks to Jeff Bradshaw, who served uh, in the interim role for a year and a half. Um, we are actively searching. We started that search last fall didn't quite get the candidate pool that we were interested in, and so we reset after January 1. Archie's leading that search. Martha Mamo, uh, Martha uh, has been uh, extended. When Martha joined us, um, we did a three-year appointment, and we've extended that to the five-year appointment. Um, congratulations to Martha. And, and I'll, um, I should have gotten the paperwork filled out, but uh, Clint Crable went through his reappointment review, and while uh, I don't have his picture uh, up there, Clint, uh, I have um, reappointed him verbally. He's accepted to be reappointed, so we'll get that paperwork uh, uh, finished up. I would like to thank uh, Dave Varner for your able and um, empathetic, caring leadership of uh, interim leadership of Nebraska Extension, Dave. Um, we wouldn't be where, where we are without that leadership at what will come down to a, a, a really tricky his time in history. Um, so thank you very much. Let's give Dave a round of applause, please. Okay, Tiffany, would you come up and introduce Bailey, please? Sure. Well, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Bailey. Uh, Bailey is a new team member to join IANR, and uh, she is leading our strategic efforts around our pathway engagements um, with Lincoln Public Schools and uh, specifically Northeast High School. And so um, what you will learn very quickly as Bailey presents is uh, she's got a lot of energy and she's very passionate about what she does. And she's joined by a couple of amazing team members that she's also going to highlight that are doing some great things for us around our K through 12 pathways. So Bailey. 
Thank you, Tiffany. I'm so happy to be invited to talk to you today about our um, partnership with Lincoln Public Schools. And like she said, specifically at Lincoln Northeast High School, which if you don't know where that is, it's only about five miles from here, just west on Holdridge and a little bit north on 63rd Street. So it's a perfect uh, group of students and community that does know a little bit about agriculture, has that in their history. Um, and so we're excited to have this partnership. First, I, I do appreciate the introduction. If you don't know how to say my last name, it's Bailey Fight. So if you're curious, that's how you say my last name. I know that I get that a lot, and I want to make sure you all know that. Uh, this program launched this summer with uh, very committed Northeast High School teachers coming to campus to learn more about agriculture and natural resources and how they can integrate that with their um, curriculum, their existing curriculum. And that's what is so cool about this is we had mathematics, visual arts, social studies, science, and world language. And they were all here um, learning about things they did not know about. They all left understanding that agriculture is so much broader and wider spectrum than they ever thought. And they created lessons that integrate these ideas of food, energy, water, and societal systems. And that's why it's called the FUSE program. Um, and they are integrating those in their everyday lessons and teaching them starting this fall to ninth and 10th graders and creating even more for these ninth and 10th graders um, throughout the entire year to have these opportunities to learn more about agriculture and natural resources. So that's part of the pre-pathway program um, with this collaboration. It's a first of its kind that integrates these concepts um, in cross-curricular classrooms for every single ninth and 10th grader. There is there's no selection. Every single student gets to participate um, in these ninth and 10th grade classes, um, learning about career exploration. They did some career exploration recently with Connect the Dots. Um, they also came to East Campus, which was one of their favorite uh, activities. I'm still hearing to this day from teachers and students that they really enjoyed their time here. Uh, they got to participate in hands-on experiential learning opportunities, open their eyes to agriculture and natural resources, um, which means every year we get to do this, we get to accomplish this with all ninth and 10th graders at Northeast. That's 900 students that will be exposed and engaged in learning about resilient food, energy, water, and societal systems. Um, as I already said, but both teachers and students have shared a lot of positive feedback. Um, the next slide has some quotes from students from their time here on campus. And um, I just, I, I love Again, it just shows how eye-opening it is for these students. They have not really heard much about agriculture and natural resources, and they don't really know what's out there for them, and they really had a good time. Um, not only students, but teachers. Teachers, you know, tend to, I was a teacher myself. I was a math teacher for 10 years, and sometimes you get these initiatives that come in, and you, it's just another initiative, and you, it adds to your plate of, of work. But these teachers are not seeing it this way. They are seeing that this is long-term. They're super excited to have the opportunity to apply what they're teaching these students to true work outside of high school, true things that are happening in the world, um, engaging these students in uh, real life problems like climate change, environmental impact, natural resources, et cetera. Um, the other thing that teachers say a lot is they're very um, excited that both entities, both UNL and LPS, have shown not only financial support, but leadership support in this program, which makes them even more excited that it's a long-term program. It's gonna become part of just the fabric of Northeast High School and the community around Northeast High School. So that's the first half with ninth and 10th. It's called the Pre-Pathway. The second half of the FUSE Focus program um, will be launching, and these are the six focus areas of that program. It's gonna be really launching in the fall where we're uh, getting 11th and 12th graders to kind of choose a focus area that uh, best fits their interests and their future plans. Um, things like entrepreneurship, food systems, health systems, leadership, et cetera. Um, they also will have the opportunity to take some Nebraska Now courses if that's what they'd like to do and get some college credit courses under their belt in high school. They also um, have the opportunity to complete digital badges or non-credit competencies that will give them a leg up when they're going out into the workforce. We also are hoping to um, have some internship opportunities, maybe some research experience opportunities for these 11th to 12th graders. 
And another exciting thing is Lincoln Northeast is committed to creating a new Fuse Experience class at on campus for 11th and 12th graders interested in Fuse. And the hope is that students are going to come around and collaborate around cross-curricular resources um, to solve problems that they see related to food, energy, water, and societal systems. Kind of taking our grand challenge idea, but doing kind of a high school level of it, which is going to be very exciting. The teachers are all about it, and that's what they're very excited for. The best thing about this program, um, and I hear it from everyone, is that it opens doors for all students, every 11th and 12th grader, no matter whether they're going to be college bound or career bound after high school, this is for everyone, and that is our hope. Lastly, I just want to finish that, um, you know, I think of these, this ninth, ninth grade class that we're starting with, and they're going to have four years. By the time they graduate, they're going to have four years of exposure to agriculture and natural resources and ready to take on future challenges through college or career. But no matter what, they're going to contribute positively to the future of their community, which I'm just absolutely stoked about. But again, this is just one example of Kasner's Education Pathway Program. Um, I get to work with a team, as Tiffany mentioned. Tammy Middlestead is my side-by-side -side partner in this. She is uh, creating more of these opportunities, expanding education and career pathways across Nebraska. Um, and Erin Ingram, as many of you know already, but she is part of our team as well with science literacy um, and building that in communities across Nebraska. So I want to finish by thanking you all for your time. Um, a lot of you have participated and volunteered your time to engage these Northeast High School students, and I hope we can continue to collaborate. Please, please contact us. Thank you. There you go. I never work very well standing behind a podium here, so. Oh. Well, you're oh. on a cord, though. Oh, I'm on a cord. Well, um, <laughs> good morning. 2022 um, will be a very exciting time for Kasner as well as INR. 2022 marks the 150th anniversary for the college, and 2023 will be the 50th anniversary for INR. These are two very important events in the history of the University of Nebraska, as well as our state. So I think it warrants a celebration. And we will be planning a year-long celebration um, that will be kicking off this next fall semester with our welcome back event that the college sponsors for our INR community. And the year-long celebration is really a time for us to reflect upon the past, we can celebrate the present, and then we can dream big about the future for INR, for CASNR, for ARD, and what that looks like for Nebraska Extension and our engagement statewide. So we will be sharing additional information later in the spring semester about what this year-long celebration is going to look like. So despite the major disruptors that we have all been navigating in the last 20 plus months, significant innovations in our teaching and learning program have occurred. For example, we had a record number of new academic credentials that were approved during this time period. And this slide illustrates some examples of those credentials, which included new degree programs, new certificates, new minors, new options, and new courses. And the work is still underway. We have academic programs that are reimagining what their degree programs look like at the bachelor's level. Conversations are underway about accelerated master's programs. Programs. What do new micro-credentials look like um, related to certificates, standalone certificates or stackable certificates? And then we're also part of some larger initiatives. And one is an interdisciplinary degree program in data science that represents a three-college partnership with College of Engineering, College of Arts and Sciences, as well as Kasner, and I see Bird up on the screen there. Um, the Department of Statistics is leading the way um, for Kasner in this space. We also have a group that's working across multiple disciplines in Kasner, um, developing a digital ag um, minor for our students. And then this past fall, the Kasner Curriculum Committee approved a new experiential learning requirement that will be part of our college core um, starting this upcoming fall semester. And this aligns 
aligns with the end 2025 strategic plan, as well as our focus as a college on holistic student development. So I wanna take this opportunity to give a big shout out to the curriculum committees at the department level, as well as the college curriculum committee for the time, energy, and creativity that you have all invested in creating these new opportunities for our students. Next, I um, want to talk a little bit about pathways. So the future of higher education is all about pathways. And Bailey did an excellent job of talking about one example of a pathway initiative that we have in the K through 12 space. A second area is around non-credit and digital badges. And this is an exciting and innovative trend in higher education. And I'm happy to share with you that the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources is leading the way in this space at the system level for their initiative around non-credit programming that they collectively refer to as NU Connect. And this initiative for INR is through a partnership with Nebraska Extension and CASNR. Our focus in this space is on the continuum of learners. So it's all about youth, it's uh, opportunities for our current students, undergrad, graduate, professional students, alumni, um, thinking about the talented workforce that we have here in Nebraska and beyond, and then lifelong learners. And the portfolio around the non-credit very much complements our credit-bearing portfolio, and it provides opportunities for learners to have increased exposure to the great impactful work that we do here in INR across our tripartite mission areas. It's also an opportunity for learners to um, focus in on professional development, upskilling, as well as intellectual growth. And so if you really want to sum up what we're doing in this space, it's all about the right pathway at the right time of life for the learner. Okay. Some examples of what we're doing in this space is um, Nebraska 4-H. They took their 4-H camps this summer and they aligned these 4-H camps with digital badges. Our goal in CASNR then is to say you've earned a certain number of digital badges through these 4-H camps. We want you to come to CASNR and we're going to give you a recruitment fellowship in order to make that possible. We have graduate students um, that have stepped up and they have created a new digital badge that's called JEDI and we're going to hear about that in a minute. It. Um, and that's an example in which our graduate students were co-creators um, with two faculty, uh, Helen Fagan and Gina Matkin, who have expertise in this space, to develop an opportunity to credential a career-ready competency for those students that really enhance their educational experience that they're getting here through CASNR and at UNL. The Food Science and Technology Department um, has been working to create a series of badges, and those are on food handling and safety um, to support the food industry in Nebraska. So these are just a few examples of um, the platforms that we've been able to develop so far. If you are interested in learning more about digital badges, non-credit, Canvas catalog, we've also been hearing that terminology, or you have an idea for a digital badge, we would love to be able to connect with you. And so I would encourage you to reach out to one of our team members, um, Kathleen Lodel. She's here in the audience along with Don and Sandra with the Nebraska Extension team. And we have Larkin Powell here um, as well as Tom Berkey on the Kasner side. All right. Next topic is around student success. And this is the top priority for us here in Kasner. It's all about our students and their success. The end 2025 strategic plan identifies a set of targets for student success, and they are framed around degree, um, time to degree, degree completion, retention, um, and also closing the equity gap. For CASNR, our goal is to achieve and even exceed um, what these end 2025 targets are. In addition to that, we want to embrace our land grant mission. And our land grant mission is all about creating opportunities. And so we want to establish a long-term goal to increase degree attainment for all learners in the state of Nebraska and beyond. And so we have been partnering with instructors, advisors, student success leads within the college as well as external partners to develop a strategic roadmap for student success that's gonna guide the important work that lies ahead of us in this space. And we're gonna be sharing that framework with you um, beginning in early February. And then 
The last topic uh, that I'm going to highlight is our focus on inclusive excellence. And so we've been very fortunate to have a team of faculty that have stepped up to lead us in this space. Um, last academic year, they led a community of practice on navigating difficult conversations. In the spring, um, they offered a workshop series on um, inclusive classrooms. And now they are prepared this spring um, to offer another workshop series. And that workshop series is focused focused on advancing inclusion beyond a generality. And it will kick off on February 24th. We're going to be sharing additional information um, through our listservs. I would encourage you to register and um, take part um, in this opportunity. And I do want to give a big shout out to those faculty members that are leading this space. Gina, Helen, we have Christian, Andrea, Leah, um, and Kate with the Department of Ag Economics. So in closing, um, none of the things that I talked about today would be possible um, without an amazing team of faculty and staff here in INR. So I just want to thank you for all that you do. And also, thank you for choosing to be a part of our INR community. And now we are going to hear from Brooke Wells. And uh, Brooke is one of our graduate students um, that was instrumental in developing the JEDI Digital Batch. Hello, I am Brooke Wells, a current doctoral student in the Agricultural Leadership, Education, and Communication Department at UNL. I have been the ALIC representative for the IANR Kasner Graduate Student Representatives Committee for a year and a half now. When I first joined the committee, we were beginning the planning for a digital badge focusing on inclusive excellence. As many of you know, there's not only a growing conversation at UNL about inclusive excellence, but there is a lot of diversity among Kasner graduate students. So by creating a digital badge to bring awareness to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, we not only could create an environment of inclusive excellence, but also highlight the uniqueness of our own students' backgrounds, personalities, and interests. Through collaboration with committee members, Kasner office staff, and ALEC faculty, we were able to create the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Digital Badge, referred to as the JEDI Digital Badge, which provides a platform for students to learn about the badge's namesake topics through two training sessions, reflective writing exercises, as well as pre and post assessments. By the completion of the badge, participants have three main outcomes. First, they're able to define and explain concepts of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Second, participants are also able to identify types of bias, stereotypes, and apply strategies for addressing stereotypes. The final intended outcome is participants' ability to connect and integrate JEDI concepts to their personal understanding of identity and lived experiences. There were many ideas of what should be included in the badge. Hopefully the activities that did make it into the badge are able to create wonderful impacts and encourage participants to further their relationship on this topic. We launched the badge this past fall and are confident that these participants and future participants will be a reflection of the work invested by many involved. Thank you. Good morning, Sherry Jones, Dean of the College of Education and Human Sciences. This morning, I thought I would give you a few updates of our building projects and a few examples of our um, accomplishments this last year related to our grand visions, which are associated with the grand challenges in the end 2025. Uh, so first related to our building projects, uh, our new building on city campus is on schedule and due to be open in August. So we will be planning to move in and hopefully we'll be ready to have classes there this fall. We have a proposal before the Board of Regents um, coming up uh, for a naming of the new building. And so hopefully the next time I get to visit with you, we can stop calling it the new building and we can uh, actually use a name uh, associated with it. This building will house our departments of child, youth, and family studies, teaching, learning, and teacher education, the dean's office, and a part of the Nebraska Center for Research on Children, Youth, Families, and Schools. So a really great place that will be about um, teacher preparation for all ages from early childhood to 12th grade, research associated with schools and children and families, um, and the administrative pieces that hopefully will keep everything um, running. 
Our, um, the Barclay Center project here on East Campus is well behind schedule, so I don't yet know when um, the new spaces there will be open. That will house the Barclay Clinic, which provides speech, language, hearing, and balance services uh, to the community, as well as renovated classroom spaces and um, faculty office spaces. And our project at the Scarlet Hotel, Mike mentioned a few proposals before the legislature for recovery money. Uh, Mike, I hope you'll support. We do have a proposal in for a small amount of money uh, from the recovery funds to help us finish the space at the Scarlet Hotel, which will house our programming hospitality restaurant and tourism management. And uh, those recovery funds are gonna help us develop and grow a hospitality leadership and innovation academy, which will um, contribute to the workforce of, in hospitality in Nebraska and uh, rebuild that workforce that has sustained a lot of losses through, throughout COVID. Uh, so uh, I think, um, let me see, we are still fundraising for the Child Development Lab School and um, so a lot of spaces happening in CEHS, and it's not just about the spaces, it's about what happens in the spaces. And as you know, the mission of the college is to enhance lives, that's about every person, and strengthening relationships, which is about every interaction. Um, I mentioned our grand visions. The college has identified three grand visions that we're going to work collectively to accomplish. Uh, they are well aligned with the N2025 grand challenges, so we will be working um, within the college and across the campus and certainly with our partners in IANR to put some proposals into the grand challenges. Uh, but I wanted to highlight some of our work across Nebraska for you. So in the area of thriving young children, uh, our uh, early childhood experts in Nebraska Extension are absolutely awesome. And they have worked this past year to directly impact nearly 120,000 caregivers, that's parents and uh, providers of child care across the state in programming and professional development. So in addition to our workforce preparation and our research in, around young children, uh, we are reaching the village uh, that surrounds young children and helps them be successful. And this is about every young child in Nebraska will be ready to thrive by the time they reach kindergarten. We are also following young children into youth and have some great programming through Nebraska Extension around youth entrepreneurship and youth development. In comprehensive health and well-being, this is about every Nebraskan having access to leading edge best practices and culturally responsive uh, practices in health and well-being. The college has three clinics uh, throughout our spaces, two that address mental health and one that addresses speech language hearing and balance problems. And these clinics are spaces where students are preparing to be healthcare professionals and hopefully fill jobs throughout the state of Nebraska. Uh, they work very hard throughout the year. We have served nearly 1,300 uh, clients in a whole variety of uh, experiencing mental health challenges, speech, language, hearing, and balance problems. And our work is both in person and virtually. So we have a lot of virtual work throughout the state of Nebraska. This slide mentions three communities in Nebraska where we have telemental health. We also have infant hearing assessments all throughout Western Nebraska via telepractice. So a lot of work happening in person and virtually to make sure that the needs of the state of Nebraska are met and that we are able to fill uh, shortages in these areas. And finally, in the area of strong communities, this is about strong communities, have strong schools and vibrant business. Oh, somebody's calling me. <laughs> um, and in this area, we have a long history, a 20 year history of preparing teachers from indigenous communities. Uh, we recently received a grant from the Department of Education to uh, begin a training program for school leaders from indigenous communities. So this will uh, enhance the diversity of the workforce in education and help us strengthen connections across all communities in Nebraska. Um, our hope is that we will make Nebraska the best place for anyone to live, because truly Nebraska is for everyone. So thank you for your time this morning, and we look forward to continuing to work together.
Hi, I'm Natalie Sihai, Extension Educator with the Nutrition Education Program. Within Nebraska, the Nutrition Education Program is made up of SNAP-Ed and FNEP. SNAP-Ed is funded by the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and we're the education arm that helps limited resource families learn how to food budget and eat healthy. As a part of that effort, um, and in serving those one in 10 or approximately 10% of Nebraskans that are food insecure across Nebraska, we implement the Growing Together Nebraska project, often called GTN. For the sixth consecutive year, Nebraska Extension SNAP-Ed project awarded funding to communities across the state through its Growing Together Nebraska project with the goal of providing fresh, locally grown produce to those in need. Across 14 counties, including 22 garden sites, over 48,000 pounds of produce were grown and or rescued and donated to an estimated 14,000 500 Nebraskans with limited resources. 214 volunteers, including 51 Extension Master Gardener volunteers, donated just under 7,000 hours of their time to assist with local projects. Fresh produce valued at just under $67,000 was distributed across 75 different emergency food distribution sites. In addition to fresh produce, youth and adults also had the opportunity to receive gardening and nutrition education at the Garden and or a partner agency. This project is successful due to the great relationships extension professionals have with their local partnering agencies, 28 of which helped our team to leverage resources at just under $11,000. Growing Together Nebraska projects for 2022 will begin in March and go through mid-November or whenever the growing season ends in Nebraska. If you have any questions about Growing Together Nebraska, reach out to Terry James or myself. You can also find information about Growing Together at food.unl.edu forward slash Growing Together Nebraska. I don't think so, but <laughs> it's a tool, Charlie. It, it's a tool. Uh, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, it was quite an honor for me to uh, to start, this is day 18 of my experience uh, with uh, Nebraska INR, uh, Dean of Extension. And uh, what we just wanted to talk a little bit about there, um, one was uh, the Odyssey. Before I even took the job here in Extension, um, Mike says he took me on a 10, I would say an 11-day Odyssey <laughs> of Nebraska, I think. I, it felt like a couple thousand miles. I wasn't quite sure. I have a mi map like Mike uh, uh, put up on the screen of all the places he's been. And he, he gave me a challenge of that he, cha I think he traveled 36,000 miles the first year he was here. And, and he challenged me that I do 50. And so uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully I'm up to that challenge. Uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about um, was IANR, Extension, uh, CASNR, CEHS, ARD are strong, are strong across the state. Your, your residents, your stakeholders are proud of you and proud of us. And um, my, my view or my vision is this, it's, I wanna just try and enhance it as the dean, the position of dean. It's not about Dr. Charlie, it's about the dean. What is Extension going to do? Um, the other thing is today's day 18. I think I've already had six. Last night I was at a, uh, uh, a reception uh, downtown. I think I've already been to six uh, stakeholder receptions, uh, meeting with the unicameral senators and others out there. And again, uh, we have a really strong system, strong support. And, um, and I just want to talk a, you know, briefly about um, the collaborations that we have out there. And um, one of the things I have, I don't have a teleprompter in front of me. I think we're talking about uh, the first priorities. So there's a map there of Nebraska, but the, the, for this, uh, for extension going forward for this position as number one is engagement, engagement zones. Uh, this is critical for us. Uh, this is the message I keep hearing, engagement zones, clarity, and where are we going? Um, I met with uh, Kathleen this morning and we talked about priorities, uh, uh, where are we gonna go? How do we communicate? Uh, clear messaging out there, uh, what we're going to do, what our game plan is. And, uh, and thanks to Mike again for the, for the leadership there um, uh, in all of that. Let's see, Mike, what's the next word there? 
academics. And so the other priority uh, for... I'm for, a little slow this morning. Uh, it's, yeah, he didn't know there's a pop quiz. <laughs> Uh, academics. Um, I just want to say thanks to uh, Dean Jones and Dean Hengmas about um, the the discussions about uh, how how getting into the academic departments, um, building on those relationships we already have there, uh, the extension specialists that are in those faculty positions, those educators, and also the educators out in our our, on our county based system. Uh, how do we enhance? those relationships, how do we continue to strengthen those? Because that is, that is one of the primary strengths of the whole Nebraska system, is our presence out at that county level. And then the third one is? Integration, Charlie. Integration, very good. And so, as we look to the future, in the system I come from, um, the idea is that our residents those who depend on us, those who we serve, really don't really care for where we are internally. All they see is there's Nebraska, the University of Nebraska, IANR, serving their needs, helping them. They don't really care. And so uh, that's, the, that's the culture um, I'm committed to, that we are an integrated system, and I think the future that we have is limitless. It really is. It just depends on us. Uh, one of the things I talked about is champions, and champions attract champions because they define their own destiny. And I really see that's the opportunity. This is a championship organization, and I'm so happy to be have the opportunity to be here. So thank you all very much. And next time I'll talk about much more highlights of that championship extension mm -hmm. team. Thank you. Thank you. I am Sandra Barrera, extension educator uh, with the Latino Small Business Program. Uh, before I start, I want to say the Latino program is for everybody. So we had, in my program, I've been working for six years in this program, so I had to see people from different countries, you know, Somalian, uh, people from China, African, Latinos, plus Anglo. So everything that we do is bilingual, because I want to see, I want to show help, uh, the whole community. Um, we started six years ago. Um, we want to help grow businesses in Nebraska. Um, we want to develop skills in entrepreneurs. We help them to keep open, open a business and keep open and grow. So we work in, you want to start a business, look for the extension, I am here to help. Uh, we have um, main, Three things that we focus on our work. First thing is education, uh, second one is business counseling, and the last one is connections and networking. And education, we are extension, so we are teachers. So we had to create programs to help entrepreneurs uh, on, on basics. So we, six years ago, we started with, uh, workshops, uh, webinars, trainings. We're looking for partners, collaborations. Um, business is a huge field, so I had to learn about uh, construction, transportation, uh, professionals, tattoo places, restaurants, food trucks. So we start with basics, teaching people about marketing, bookkeeping, taxes, um, social media, um, uh, yeah, everything about city goals. So after we start the curriculums and we start seeing needs, we see that we have a huge need about uh, education by fields, by industries. So we have to, we have to create curriculums looking for experts. So we create the academies programs. So we have restaurant uh, academy, cleaning companies, academy, construction companies. So we had to create different things and we had to look for experts. So we, example, for restaurant academy, we had to look for inspectors. We had to teach about food safety. We had to talk about nutrition because we want a healthy menus. Uh, we bring people for nutrition and they came to teach entrepreneurs about healthy menus and we try to create a, a nice menus and design the menus for healthy community and offer healthy things for the community. So we had academies and um, in education, we have the programs, basic programs, the academies, and we have the first time last year in 21, we had the first Latino small business conference. So we have 150 people, the 
participants, we held this in Grand Island and Omaha. It was the first time that we have a conference. Uh, it was amazing to see people there, entrepreneurs meeting together and had the first conference. It was tough as a challenge. We had to bring the entrepreneurs, we had to bring suppliers, we had to bring the speakers, and we're looking for volunteers. We had sponsors, and we're going for the second one. This year we have, uh, right now, working with Google, because we want mm. to talk about technology. So we'll see if we can do something in Spanish. So this is our education. Um, besides that, we have the business consulting. Uh, we have help entrepreneurs one face to face and we help the entrepreneur step by step what they need about legal papers. So we do everything about LLCs, uh, we do working with the IRS, Nebraska Revenue, uh, we get permits, you know, we're talking with the inspectors and the health departments, we had to make the connections. Sometimes I had to call and go to the inspections and see what they wanted and help with relations. Um, building inspectors, fire marshals, city codes, everybody in the community, we bring the people to the entrepreneur and we're working to help fast and, and make the environment easy for the entrepreneur. Um, also, mm, we help them to create a business plan. So we're working with the students, help, help, helping me with their business plans and marketing plans. And the good thing, and you can see in the yellow thing is free. Everything is free, you don't charge anything to entrepreneurs. And um, also, um, we do work, in the, I think so the hard part is the connections and networking. Uh, we start a coffee table, so every month we have meetings, they come and we have coffee. Sometimes we have meetings without coffee, now it's in Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they come and we have information about what is going on in the community, what kind of the aspects in the, uh, environment affecting businesses. We try to work together and, 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 and make connections in the community. Also, uh, we do referrals, we do a mentoring program, and we do a business tour. Uh, it's a part of the program because we open a business, but we want to see the communities, the community support Latino more businesses. So we bring the Anglo community to the businesses, and we make a tour, the people learn about that. We do trainings to the Latinos, the, the business to about customer service, they had to learn a little English to welcome the clients. Uh, and we listen recommendations for the for the participants. And it's a nice thing that like year we have 50, 55 people the participating in tours. And now, before it was the community, now we have agencies and organizations that come as a staff and come and do the tours on the business. So you are welcome. Remember, Tuesday is the Taco Tuesday day. Yeah. So please. Welcome and support <laughs> Latino businesses around. Oh, yeah, go. Oh, I forgot. Last year, and the sixth year, we had served 221 new businesses to start up. And don't forget the COVID. We had to work so hard. Thanks to, to UNL, we get the hand sanitizers and we develop flyers for COVID. We help to support people on SBA loans, BP loans. Um, are we working on that? So, done. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's always a great pleasure for me to be able to present the ARD Junior Faculty for Excellence in Research Awards. This award was established back in 1991 by the ARD Faculty Advisory Council, and it's made possible uh, by the Ruth Branham family. Uh, it's awarded annually to a tenure-track assistant professor with an ARD appointment uh, who has a maximum of five years of professional service at UNL. And the three criteria are publication record, evidence of external funding, and peer recognition. And I want to thank all of those who nominated uh, individuals for this award this year. And, and just no congratulations for anyone who has been nominated for this award. I also want to thank the committee from the ARD uh, Faculty Advisory Council who uh, evaluates um, these nominations. I sat in and listened to this and it's one of the most difficult processes that I 
uh, engage in each year. The, the quality of nominees is just incredible. And just to give you a little uh, idea of that, uh, I did this last year as well, and I've added last year's award winners to this list. And you can just see, going back to 2015, the names and think about the trajectories that those individuals uh, are continuing, have continued at the University of Nebraska. Uh, this year's award winners are joining us virtually, and I wanna make sure they know that we will congratulate you virtually today, and then please stop by the ARD office because there is a physical award for you as well. The first award winner is Jessica Corman. Jessica is assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources and a faculty fellow of the Doherty Water for Food Institute and the Center for Great Plains Studies. She received her PhD in biology from Arizona State University and completed postdoctoral training at the Center for Limnology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research focus uh, is on understanding patterns of elemental cycles and natural environments with an emphasis on research linked to environmental and water sustainability questions. She's authored and co-authored 28 peer-reviewed articles in leading disciplinary journals and delivered 35 presentations at national and international conferences. Her research is funded by the National Science Foundation the Nebraska Environmental Trust, and the Nature Conservancy. She's worked on projects around the world, from Patagonia to Guatemala to East Africa, and locally from the Niobrara River to Scotts Bluff and the Sand Hills. So please join me in congratulating Dr. Corman. Our second award. Our award winner is Ju Ju Yu. Dr. Yu is assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition and Health Sciences. She's had that appointment since 2017. She received her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and postdoctoral training at both the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne and Harvard University. Her main research interests are to investigate the molecular mechanisms of chronic inflammation and complex diseases such as metabolic diseases and neurodegenerative diseases and to identify new nutraceuticals to suppress that kind of inflammation. Her research is funded by USDA NIFA and NIH and she's authored 26 research articles and many of them are in High impact journals such as the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, Theranostics, Nature Communications, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. She serves as a proposal reviewer for grant panels at USDA and NIH and is a manuscript reviewer for many of those same journals. So please join me in thank thanking, congratulating Dr. Yu. Well, I just want to touch on, I want to share some comments on three things that are happening in INR, but they're associated with ARD. And Mike already talked about this one, so just briefly back to the grand challenges. We're aware of the seven themes, and we're aware that INR can and should provide a cornerstone in addressing these grand challenges and the success that can be realized. Uh, we hosted a, uh, an event here in this room for INR around the Grand Challenges on December 15th, and we invited um, uh, everyone from across INR, but also uh, from across campus, and the engagement was really incredible, and it pointed out for me that even though you in INR have, each of you has a very successful program, it takes a lot of work to maintain that, some of you are directing very successful centers, but you found the way to engage in this uh, appropriately and effectively. And I think you recognize that the collaborative connections that you will make through this process, the ideas and the plans that emerge through this process will have 
value for the grand challenges and beyond. So again, uh, thanks for your engagement so far. And Mike mentioned the virtual town hall on February 1st. So it's another step in that. Nebraska Integrated Beef Systems. Uh, I wanted to first recognize John Pollock and Walt Schock for their roles in this effort as uh, they retire from their roles with the university. The momentum that they helped to achieve along with our faculty to establish the, the faculty committee, the, the external advisory committee, and, and really just to um, achieve greater engagement across the broad community of INR and UNL was really a tremendous step forward. So I want to thank them for that. And, and really a lot of that uh, was formalized, for example, invited uh, the new external advisory team to attend a two-day workshop last October. In addition to the important connections that they made with our unit leaders across INR, there's also really, I see it as a triad partnership that was formed that connected the, the deep knowledge and network that John Pollock brought in beef production sciences with the Center for Grassland Studies and the Center um, for um, Resilient Agricultural Working Landscapes. Uh, so again, that was a really, that was a really important uh, step in broadening the scope of Nebraska Integrated Beef Systems. So heading into February, we'll be completing a plan for a transition of this shared leadership that can capture that momentum that they helped to create with all of you. And then just one other thing I wanted to mention is a Nebraska trade mission to the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, and Jordan that's sponsored by the Nebraska Secretary of State and, and really focuses on or a main part of this trip is an expo in Dubai there will be over 180 countries at this expo, each one with their own pavilion. So it's a, it's a huge expo. And Nebraska will be one of four states in the U.S. Uh, pavilion for the expo. So there are representatives of INR uh, who will be part of a group of 28 people from Nebraska showcasing programs in water security, digital agriculture, beef production, and food for health. So I just wanted to make sure you are aware of this. And another way for us to, to really support the state of Nebraska, and in this case, globally. Thank you. Thanks, Archie. I'm Patricio Grassini, Associate Professor at the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture at the UNL. And together, I'm going to describe our efforts in developing the global yield gap atlas. Our global food demand is expected to increase by 50% over the next 30 years due to increased population and changes in diets. The question is how we are going to meet that increased food demand. Unfortunately, we are not on a sustainable pathway. We are expanding our cropland at a rate of 30 million acres every year, many times encroaching natural ecosystems such as peatlands, savannas, and forests. Then the question is, how can we feed the growing population while minimizing the environmental footprint? Here in, here in Nebraska, we are trying to answer that question. Back in 2013, we have started to develop a platform known as the Global Yield Gap Atlas, which provides estimates of yield gaps for major food crops across 70 countries. This platform is being developed in collaboration with Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And the data from the platform has been downloaded by more than 50,000 users so far. We are now trying to develop a license program through which companies have to pay when downloading data from the Atlas, while other users, such as farmers, nonprofits, and governments, can still access the data for free. The revenue from these licenses will help to sustain the Atlas over the long term. We hope that with the support from the licenses, together with the institutional support from UNL and INR, our, our team can keep thinking big and try to identify pathways that can help reconcile crop production with environmental protection, not only here in Nebraska, but also for the rest of the world.
So we are at the witching hour, but I would ask your, um, your support. Um, there is a section that Rich will uh, videotape and will make available around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. That's a tight series of slides. Uh, Rich presented this to the senior leadership team uh, just before our meeting with the IENR Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. It's a great set of, of uh, probably two, two and a half minutes worth. Uh, Larry Van Tassel, I'd like to ask you up to highlight the Center for Agricultural Profitability. Thank you, Mike. It's a privilege to be able to be here today. And uh, <clears throat> the Center for Agricultural Profitability is based in the Department of Agriculture Economics, and is, uh, it's, but it's interdisciplinary in nature, both in research and also in extension. Our website is at cap.unl.edu, and I encourage you to take a look there. <clears throat> the mission of the Center for Ag Profitability is to support informed decision making in agriculture through applied research and education. Our vision is to be innovative, responsive, uh, to be the innovative, responsive, and trusted source of agriculture management resource, research and education. <clears throat> the, uh, we currently have ex expertise uh, right now in crop marketing, risk management, livestock marketing, risk management, farm financial management, ag policy, land management, and farm succession and estate planning. Um, we <clears throat> have been successful in reaching Nebraska producers through weekly articles and Nebraska Farmcast podcasts, weekly seminars, extension programs, both online and in person, and also the development of decision apps. Some of our most popular uh, products include annual Nebraska farm and ranch, or farm and ranch real estate reports, which provides uh, current estimates of ag land values and also cash rental rates, the Nebraska Farm Custom Rates Report, Nebraska Land Link Program, which seeks to connect beginning farmers and ranchers with uh, landowners that are transitioning out of ag, uh, ag carbon and conservation resources, crop and livestock enterprise budgets. We have nearly a hundred of those uh, budgets for commodities that are grown in Nebraska and also uh, the Ag Budget Calculator, which allows producers to upload those budgets and modify them for their own operation or start from scratch and, and develop their own. Um, this has turned into quite the decision-making tool for producers uh, currently. 2021 was our first full year in existence, and during that year we had about 137,000 page views uh, 400 or 4,400 web webinar viewers and about 5,100 podcast listens. So thank you. Thanks, Larry. Um, I think Patricio pointed to this. You know, I always think about IENR as being about uh, feeding, fueling, fibering a growing world sustainably taking care of our water, our air, our land, and the people that produce that food and the communities that they're a part of. And I think um, the, the highlight reels, the speakers uh, shared today, the programming that the dean shared definitely fits uh, within that space. Um, I had uh, a quick slide on the financial health of IENR just to bring that back. Uh, two pieces, a budget reduction reminder, and I don't want to go into the the gory details, but I just want to use it as um, a marker, Craig, of our resilience. Um, you will remember in 2020, uh, spring, when COVID hit, uh, a series of budget reductions took place. For UNL, that was a $38.3 million reduction in our permanent budget. IANR's share of that was $10.1 million. And we are now uh, just about to the end of the second year of that three-year um, budget reduction process. Uh, Jeff Basford will tell you that we're about 60% of the way. So we've returned and cut $6 million. I will say that the hardest tranche, the last $4 million, $4.1 million, occurs starting in July 
And um, it's only possible that we've been able to navigate that reduction and manage those cuts while still growing and innovating because of each and every one of you and the near 90 individuals across the platform that actually are in named leadership roles. We will get through it. We're growing. I think uh, you've done everything that I've asked. Uh, keep, keep breathing, keep your feet moving, keep the focus on making the world a better place in these areas that we've heard about. Lastly, I wanted to remind you on the budget side that we will be implementing as part of the N2025 strategy platform an incentive-based budgeting program. It's a radical change for the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and we're, uh, we're in, in the um, deep stages now of working with unit leaders that have financial stewardship responsibilities about what that looks like uh, at the division and college, department, center, uh, 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 level of the organization. So stand by and thanks. As I've said before, um, our job is to manage through these. Uh, your job is to advance the mission. So, um, so far we're doing okay and we're keeping, keeping the upward trajectory going. So if you have questions on the budget, just uh, let me know. And then I'd like to just kind of bring us home I think um, I'm not going Imagine if you could follow a drop of water <laughs> on a 900 mile journey downstream from mountains to plains. Imagine if you could listen to its myriad stories as it makes its way from an alpine trout stream to a prairie river full of cranes. Or from a staircase of massive dams and reservoirs to a six inch pipe that waters a farmer's thirsty crop field. The Platte River Basin is one of the most appropriated river systems in the world. Every drop of water is spoken for, and little is free. The basin supports an industrial agricultural powerhouse laid over one of the most endangered and altered grassland ecosystems on Earth. Beneath the ground, it harbors more than half of the mighty Ogallala Aquifer, fossil water whose quantity and quality are now at stake. Today, this basin is being asked to be both food producer and energy pump in an age of climate change and economic uncertainty. What if we could use the tremendous power of photography and storytelling to see a watershed in motion? What if we could leverage those images to dig deeper and grow understanding about our water resources? and build community throughout a watershed. What if this could be used as a template to start a conversation and look at other stressed watersheds around the world? This is what inspires us. This is our aim. Join us on the journey. Thanks for all you do. Thanks for the extra few minutes there. Have a great day and a wonderful semester.